your China, Singapore's, even your, your, your US and your Europe after World War II. They had a single purpose that this is what we want uh, to do. If it is industrialization, we want to industrialize. Uh, Singapore, your Hong Kong, is, we want to be manufacturers of this. Kenya, one day you hear, oh, we want to be the medical hub for East Africa. The next day, oh, we want to be the financial hub. But the next day, oh, we want to be the trans transport logistics. Oh, the next day, he has 10 billion, let's build Konza City. We want to be the Silicon Savannah of, we have no one single purpose of, uh, and, and the importance of having one single goal or purpose is that everything else then feeds in and falls into place. So if you, for example, if we say we, we want to be um, the, 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 um, the medical hub for, for the region, you know, uh, where everyone comes here for medical tourism, then you sit down now and say, okay, so what needs to be put in place for us to be able to, to do that? Yeah? Then the infrastructure, you don't go build an expressway and you want to be a medical hub. You are building hospitals. You are building factories that manufacture equipment that are used in hospitals. Your education system changes. You don't churn out more accountants. Uh, sorry, uh, you don't churn out more accountants. You want more doctors. You want more ICU nurses. You want more ra uh, radiologists. Uh, I think Dr. Wede can tell you, if, if you want um, a radiologist, uh, those ones that do laparoscopy and stuff like that, I think there are only three or four. And those guys will charge you an arm and a leg because they only know you only have four options if you're not flying out of, of the country. So because of not having a single purpose, you realize, one, we have an education system which is broken. Uh, we have policies. But, but, but which, general, which, we have Vision 2030. I was, waiting for, you to, I was waiting for you to say, <laughs> to say that. Ask anyone in here what is contained in Vision 2030. Ask even the current president and his deputy what is contained in Vision 2030. And if they cannot explain it to you in five points, they don't know what Vision 2030 is. And I know Vision 2030 comes with the thing that it came during Kibaki's time. It's a brilliant thing. Kibaki was doing a great thing. Some of the problems that we have now is because of Kibaki's economic model. What did Kibaki's economic model do? If you had capital, you became very rich. If you did not have capital, you are still poor now. Why? Because the income that a person like me, who only has wage, who only has labor as a resource, our wages have been stagnant and reducing. But the guys who have capital have been growing. The guys who own land have been becoming rich. So if you already had capital during Kibaki's time, you became rich, extremely rich. And everyone said, Kibaki has done a good job. But those few pockets of billionaires that were created during Kibaki's time are the same people that have state capture, are the same people that determine who becomes president, are the same people that are running the few businesses that are there, um, and, and literally now they are protecting the, the, their wealth. So, yeah. so that started during Kibaki's time. Uh, the second thing that we, uh, any politician who's coming and does not mention is Kenya has structural problems, economic structural problems. Number one that we mentioned is corruption. I'll give you an example. If you take a container from Mombasa, by the time you are reaching the border to Malaba, you've passed through 20 to 25 police checks. And each one of those, you are paying a bribe to cross over. Cross over to Uganda, you're only stopped if you're overspeeding and stuff like that. Yeah? The cost of that, the cost of corruption in, in the country, where the president put it at 2 billion a day, um, that's the monetary value. But if you look at the cost of corruption in the education sector, is mm -hmm. students learning under trees. The cost of corruption in the medical sector is people dying uh, because of not getting, that's the real cost of corruption. The other structural problem that we have um, as, as a country is that our education is very, our labor force is thin. So if you look at the people that are actually available for labor, majority of them did not finish primary school or have not actually even gone to school. Yeah? For the ones that have even gone to school up to university, you realize 90, 70 to 80 percent of them are in social sciences. Yeah, because we don't have a single focus point where we're saying this is what we want to do, so we need to generate more of. Right. You know. So right now, if you if if you want to make Kenya a uh, medical hub and you start building hospitals, you will not have enough medical personnel to to do that, which now makes the cost of doing that uh, possible. And and the final thing, maybe just because of of time, mm -hmm. people complain about the wage bill of the government. Yeah, but the wage bill of the government only consumes 28%, even less, of the revenue generated. Debt consumes 60 to 65% of the revenue that is currently generated. Any person who's coming into 2022 who has no plan on how to deal with the debt problem that we have, has no answer for Kenya. Because every revenue that you're going to be generating, 
60 actually by the time 2022 comes it will be around 70 percent so for every 100 shillings 70 cents is going to pay debt that means that is unproductive money mm -hmm. you're only left with 30 to pay salaries you will have no money to implement any economic model that you are you you want to talk about right so anyone who's coming into power in 2022 and they do not have a plan on how to handle the debt situation and this thing of rebasing gdp to try and sort out your debt is not a solution of sorting out debt mm -hmm. yeah uh, rest as hotel it's an accounting entry you have doubled the, the gdp so that your debt to gdp ratio uh comes down so if any person who comes right and is not able to do that then you're going to have a serious problem R right uh hear you Daktari, so are we lost and because the stability of the careers we are in all of us here <clears> depends <throat> heavily on what you do today yeah. so what is the doctor's fraternity doing to ensure that yes there's this perception that politics is dirty but what is the profession doing to ensure that their voice is heard through this election yeah, thank you. So uh, I think uh, let me just echo what um, the previous speaker has spoken first uh, on the issue of structures. Uh, if you look at this country, we have uh, uh, like a political de de decree uh, kind of system, mm -hmm. top, uh, bottom. That is the one that is the governance uh, go-to uh, model that you are using. And uh, by doing that, what it does is actually isolates the voice of the technocrats and the professionals with, within those different uh, ministries and agencies of the government. So when um, we continue with this uh, broken kind of, uh, of governance, then you find that uh, the, the policies that are coming out uh, and the laws that are being made by parliament, then do not speak to the actual development agenda of this country. So we then end up infiltrating the sector with the policies that have been developed by quacks. Uh, with no professional input and ultimately uh, if the government does not realize this then it will lead to the breakdown of uh, uh, the governance system so i think uh, it's important that uh, as professionals mm -hmm. um, and i like all the sentiments of uh, the president of uh, lsk nelson harvey i know uh, uh, he's been really calling out professionals to actually come out mm -hmm. and take the lead uh, as, uh, as a doctor fraternity uh, we are actually encouraging most of our members, uh, and uh, we have doctors all over this country uh, who have access to the common one inches. They treat them, they, they talk to them, um, but to actually uh, try to influence uh, uh, this particular uh, common one inch in terms of the choices they make. Especially right now, when you're hearing so many people complaining about uh, access to health mm -hmm. uh, during this COVID pandemic, people are uh, uh, holding a base, there are no ICU beds, but you tell them it's the people you put in power. Uh, the government actually allocated money for isolation bed for ICU facilities in all our counties. Right now, people are still struggling to uh, uh, access ICU uh, uh, facilities. This is right. two years, almost two years down the line. So as a professional body, we're actually even urging and pushing most of our members uh, to actually run for political office so that to try change the narrative from within. Mm -hmm. We are also urging most of our uh, members in different branches uh, to come together and uh, uh, talk to these politicians on the ground. But Dr. Yeah. is that a good thing? I mean, going to med school, specialized, many years of uh, input, and then you end up in politics? Yeah. Is there, uh, is there a better way? We, we have no choice because uh, the environment which we have been forced to operate is no longer working. So if you are trying to, you are putting people in parliament, and uh, be electing um, uh, members of parliament to make better policies to make health accessible to all mm -hmm. and you're not able they're not able to do that work you can't just keep on as i mentioned earlier you can't keep on uh, hoping after every election cycle that things will become better so the only way uh, for us to improve the current situation is to actually to get involved in that politics itself and uh, I'm um, happy with the, the moves that have been made in terms of uh, trying to ensure that even from the MCA level, that we have people, professionals, uh, being, uh, being the people to, uh, eligible to run for those particular seats. Mm -hmm. so, FCP Amolo, of yeah. course, we have a country that has, what has been said many times, a progressive constitution. It talks about public participation as a very important principle. But what has happened to lobbying? Because if a medical doctor of many years of experience would aspire uh, to assume the office that is basically in the field of politics, what's going on? And what do we do uh, to secure the professional 
uh, fields that we have in the country, but at the same time ensure that whatever happens in politics and governance is guided by pure thought? Um, many things have happened, and I'll just mention again for, for the sake of uh, brevity, the space for civic education shrunk from what we knew in the 90s, for example, uh, like what drove the change the constitution process uh, of those days. That space was occupied by professionals. Uh, uh, you know, it was, um, I was lucky to be part of that uh, in the accounting area. Uh, I did what I could for the nation. And what Dr. Were uh, is saying here is absolutely true. You need the civic space occupied by men and women that are able to articulate issues, not just from a shouting point of view and running on the streets with leaves, but are able to think through issues, develop them, and then bring them out in a way that people can understand. And some of the greatest people, of course, that we have had uh, uh, today, including the former Chief Justice, uh, William Mutunga, that was the arena where he was operating. Uh, uh, Honorable Kivuta Kibwana, those are the people who are leading the thinking in that area. And uh, many, many others, by the way, including uh, Dr. Mkisa Kitui and so on and so on, uh, great men like uh, Elkana Udembo, Irungu Houghton, those were the thinkers. And you have people like Davinda Lamba that took an area like land and clearly developed uh, things that then helped the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and as professionals, accountants like myself, we played other roles. Now, when you have that civic space with literally a vacuum, you are going nowhere. So you need, we need to re-engineer that space so that we can have some very, very clever thinking going into that area to be able to re-educate even our nation of today. Uh, we, we, have, we have 11 months to the election, actually less now, but whatever you're suggesting here, is it possible within that very short time, knowing that already people are taking sides, the realignment is taking shape, is it a possibility? Something is better than nothing. And uh, it is still possible because uh, organizing and reorganizing a grassroots um, passing on of knowledge, it takes time, that I agree. But we rather start now so that the next government and the next leader can be told without um, looking for many words that, you know what, things need to be done in a particular manner. And that needs to be a continuous process. Because I can tell you one thing, and you can count on my word for this, the next president is going to have a hard time. He is not going to jail people, ensure people go to jail as they should, for example, for corruption, because he will be on a policing mission. All right? But the one that follows ought to have been readied in such a way that he can come back like Akigami and say the day you are mentioned for corruption, step aside. In the current climate, can you do that? You will not. Because my people will go to the streets and say that uh, I am great and it is you who is wrong. Mm -hmm. Engineer Mushemi, many Kenyans will be incapacitated to engage in a conversation like you're having here, and also to influence policy, bearing in mind the economic situation, their education level, and how far they are from the center of power, whether it's in the country or in the counties. And so, as the professionals like yourself, that um, know so much about a country, know what works or does not, how then, what is your small contribution to this engagement to ensure that come 2022 in subsequent elections, there's this sense of accountability that is engineered by professionals, and in this case, engineers like yourself. I think just to go back to what Dr. Ali was saying, I think we need more professionals in that, in that August House, making the right decisions and based on uh, in knowledge. 
because at, as things start now, uh, and you brought it when you are responding to what Dr. Ali is saying, you are saying we as professionals should step aside, let the guys out there do whatever they are doing, when we can see clearly that they are doing the wrong things. I think they are sort, they are, they are sort on professionals did not start today. I mean, some time back, somebody somewhere, and I think this, this channel was put in place, is that they, they said you don't need a CEO or a doctor to be a CEO of a medical institution. I think that was one of the assets, and uh, the results are there for us to see, which I think was unfortunate. Uh, as we speak now, Sam, there is a piece of this legislation going on in Parliament where they are saying they want to change the registration because since our regime of uh, road agencies, the authorities dealing with roads, there was a specific requirement that the CEO of that institution must be a civil engineer. For obvious reasons, he's an expert in that field. Now, the registration going on in Parliament to change that. And the proponents are saying, you don't need to be an engineer to run an institution or you need to be as a manager. Mm -hmm. In a way, are they saying an engineer or a doctor cannot be a manager? Is that, is that the impression they are creating? So I think it's important, if you are going to make a difference, Sam, we must get into politics. Those of us who are of, of that kind of inclination. I don't agree with you that we must keep off. Martin Luther King, God bless his soul, said, eh, if you do no, not take an interest in politics, remember, politics will take an interest in you. Because it is your tax, it is your livelihood that's being messed up. So, for heaven's sake, let us get in there. And as engineers... But, but engineer, we don't have a shortage of professionals in parliament. Um, we have several lawyers. We have a couple of doctors. We have a couple of accountants, including the minority leader of ODM, John Buddy. Um, if you go to cabinet, in fact, the politicians are in the minority. Majority of those um, experts uh, taken, of course, because of the new constitution, taken from different industries, industries whether it's banking, whether it's uh, diplomacy, or whatever industry it is, yet we still have this gap. So uh, what I'm asking is, yes, you may get into parliament, but there appears to be what he called state capture. How do you deal with that, whether it's inside the house or outside the house? I, I believe as professionals we, we can, we can uh, make a difference. I think what we have had in this country over the years is what you call career politicians. For them, they see they are allowed to follow a party leader to do the right thing and not make a difference. I believe as professionals we can make a difference. And uh, that's an, an one area that engineers have taken a lead in. They have lobbied, they have pushed, and I believe we are getting something. Because this kind of legislation, which should not see the right of day, in the interest of the nation, not in the interest of the politicians, unfortunately, because we felt it was being pushed for a political agenda, not for a professional agenda. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we are moving. We are, we, want, we are telling our people, get in there and please make a difference. Don't become a career politician. And why do you think there's an assault on uh, education standards in the parliament? It's because they are uncomfortable with the, with the professionals. They think yeah, the fewer educated people you have in those august institutions, the better for them. Mm -hmm. The better for control. And Unfortunately. And I want us to switch gears and look at uh, some of the proposals that have been given by different political uh, class. Reginald, you've been on the show and you've uh, clearly set out uh, what you think may not work for uh, at least the bottom-up approach. So I'll not be labeled that point, but I'll give an opportunity to, re to reflect <laughs> on that. But let me begin with you, FCP Omolo. Um, when you look at um, these political leaders, the ones that have come out, of course, many are saying that we want to unite, we want to make uh, the vote of our region count. They are talking about Mount Kenya or the arid and semi-arid lands, which is okay, so that people can have a way of uh, influencing how the interest can be attained. But when you look at these leaders, do you see any sense of intention to correct some of these challenges that you're facing here? And moving forward, what are the few things that you'd want to see corrected uh, in the next regime? Um, the lot which is there, um, I think there is uh, there just one or two people, I don't want to mention names, that I could uh, trust, that can actually set an agenda and drive it to conclusion. And within five years, you would see a difference in this country. Uh, the rest of them are uh, what you would call uh, people aspiring and, of course, making a lot of noise. 
and it is not the noise which is the thing, it is not the smoke which is the fire, you need the real fire. And um, that context I hope is understood. Now, what we need and what is it we can expect? We will, um, in my view, there will be a rather hard entry for whoever will be coming in. Contest is going to be very high. I see only coalitions working and not outright uh, winners. It can happen, I might be wrong, but uh, from what I can see. But at the end of the day, we need a person who is not tainted because this country needs solutions. And I cannot speak about or against something that I myself am involved in. And um, some I would like to stop it there, but that would be my input. I might have used some loaded words, have other meanings, but I hope the meanings will play out. I just wish you could clarify, because you say only two people you see that could follow through whatever agenda they have set out to achieve. Yeah. I wish you could. They are both my friends, <laughs> <laughs> and I would not like to bias anybody. Okay, all right. Uh, Dr. Were, we live in interesting times. You talk about the situation of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I remember when it started in March, when it got to the country in March 2020, we were having these conversations, let's speak after COVID, um, post-COVID uh, recovery. Mm. Look, it's now September 2021. 20, There's no indication that that post-COVID is coming. It's just learning how to manage. Mm. We're talking about more than 244,000 infections reported. And more than, actually, it's 4,928 deaths so far reported. Could be more. Um, the health facility is not exactly doing well. Just a few weeks ago, we had challenges with the access to oxygen. Yet, we have 11 months to the election. The campaign tempo is rising. Of course, the church is saying we will not allow you to come to the pulpit. That may force the politicians to go back to the public gatherings. What are these things that you need to do uh, through this process that also requires a lot of civic participation, mm -hmm. but do it safely within a pandemic at a time that vaccines remain a challenge for this country? Yeah. I think, I think some, uh, the way to, uh, because we, we as KME, uh, and as part of the profession, so we should, uh, several advisories uh, on what needs to be done. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, most of the time, uh, you'll find that advice from the professionals is not taken seriously. And, and that's why we kept on having uh, cycles, uh, uh, outbreaks and outbreaks uh, now in the fourth wave. Uh, I think uh, where we are now, because uh, the, the, the ministry says we're not exactly in the fourth wave. They haven't officially acknowledged it. Uh, they haven't officially acknowledged it, but if you look at the numbers, if you look at the institutions, if you look uh, how uh, it has been difficult to access uh, the, the ICU beds or mm -hmm. uh, critical care, it's out there for you to see. Uh, okay. And the number of deaths, the way that, although we are now recovering, it's now going down the, the positivity rate. Mm -hmm. But I think what we need to do as a country is uh, stop uh, this issue of dependence on donations. In as much as uh, uh, there's nationalism of vaccines all over the world, I think Kenya has enough uh, muscle diplomatically to ensure that you can get enough vaccines. At least we get to a target of around 15 million Kenyans before the elections. Because it doesn't make sense for me to go to vote for someone uh, while the next day I'm uh, in critical care and I lose my life. So I think what we need to do and prioritize as we plan, because it will be very hard uh, to say that when you go for the rallies uh, to ensure that everyone uh, complies to the Ministry of Health guidelines in terms of social distancing, wearing a mask and sanitation. I think the government needs to prioritize and move with speed mm -hmm. to have each and every Kenyan uh, vaccinated. And I've, as I've mentioned, if we target 15 million bef in the next eight months, mm -hmm. then uh, we should be able uh, to have at least uh, a good uh, election that is safe and where the citizens who are now there choosing their leaders are protected. Right now, we have gotten around 4 million vaccines. Um, we just need to use a diplomacy muscle and get 11 million doses to have everyone protected. Okay. Yeah. All right. Of course, the government says that uh, by the end of the year, they want to have 10 million uh, Kenyans fully vaccinated. By d d June next year, uh, 26 million 
uh, Kenyans fully vaccinated, that's the adult population. And Reginald, look, every election cycle, there are challenges in this country, whether it's in terms of peace, uh, conflict, uh, economic uh, downturn. If you to look at what's happening in Laikipia, it's the build up towards that election. So for uh, countries whose economy takes a beating every election year, look, we contracted in 2020. Uh, something may happen in the remaining 11 months. What are these things that you think a Kenyan in their private sense can do to cushion themselves against the shocks that will come with all this um, situation? Uh, as, as, as a private citizen, one way of doing it, if you have the ability to, to save, uh, this is the time you, you save more. Um, the opportunities that come with every uh, election in terms of which asset classes you can put in your money uh, to make a bit of more 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 return um, if you have a friend who has a printing press uh, who needs capital to be able to print t-shirts and caps uh, that's a source of investment invest in that business make your return but some of these businesses make money every five years eh? um, if you want if you're looking at shares to, to buy not an endorsement of any uh, media house, but if you're looking at guys who handle uh, advertising and media houses during election time, most people are doing adverts and all that. Um, those are good things to go put your uh, your, your money in. Um, but definitely you don't want to put your money in, in areas that are affected by the movement of the economic cycle. So most probably you see most money will go into fixed deposits. Uh, some will start buying dollars, um, mm -hmm. those who have money, so that you just try to insulate your, your, yourself, um, insulate yourself on that. Um, but I think what one major thing that we can do as citizens is start with the current crop of leaders that are there. Hold them accountable. Yeah, uh, We know the DP is, is running for, for a post. Hold them accountable. You've been there for the last eight years. You have said all these things. What have you? Uh, done. Uh, your member of parliament who is seeking for uh, a receipt, yeah? ask him what have you done in the last um, five, five years as, as a member of parliament. And he should not point to you a toilet, a classroom or a road. That is not his job as a member of parliament. His job is legislation. Yeah? So you want to ask a member of parliament, what bills did you support and how do those bills affect me? Did you support any bill? You know Kenya is very interesting. It's, I think it's the only country where you see politicians make more noise on Twitter than inside parliament. Uh, then I've seen another politician saying, oh, fuel prices have gone up and stuff. I'm thinking, but you know, IPRA reports to you people eh, in parliament. You actually can fire and hire everyone, anyone in IPRA. You can actually put a legislation that fuel cannot pass this, mm -hmm. this price. Mm -hmm. So uh, our members of parliament, and I always say parliament sometimes is the, uh, the weakest link in, 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 in Kenya moving forward. Because we have parliamentarians that don't do the job of parliamentarians, which is proposing bills or supporting bills that actually affect the lives uh, of Kenyans. So if, even the guys who are in Hasla Nation who are saying us, we are Hasla Nation, you need to ask them, okay, as a person who is saying Hasla Nation, in the last five years, did you pass any single bill that helps me as a, as a Hasla? Please note, any tax increase you have seen, any fuel increase you have seen, any government borrowing you have seen has been approved by parliament. Okay. So they cannot play ignorant. Mm -hmm. So if they say, oh, cost of living is gone high, the problem is the same MP that approved those things in the finance bill. So they cannot come around and start telling you, oh, no, these guys are doing wrong. Our weakest link is parliament. So without even worrying about who becomes president, we should be worrying are we getting the right people into parliament who will push the right legislation right. to make sure that things go well. Right, and Engineer Mushami, you'll have the final word after the feedback. Mark Corey, <laughs> wow, you're saying this is unbelievable. We have no source of income. Life has gone up all the way. Our hopes are being buried each and every day by those who think uh, they are there to help us, by those we think are there to help us. Um, Sir Alex Kimutai, going by the sharp rise in fuel prices, Kenyans who have been in slumberland will <laughs> slumberland <laughs> will wake up. Um, Engineer Lazaro, mega projects without approval from the economic experts and mega corruption scandals are some of the virus that brought down our economy. Bernard Kipps, please, government must try lower the price of almost everything. Everything is currently costly, making lives of common Mwananchi difficult. And uh, Kateg, what the government should do is create an environment where people's disposable incomes are high to enable investments. The hue and cry is evidence that money 
isn't in people's pockets. Opembe Edgar, I was in Tanzania and things are eight to ten times cheaper. Investors flocking Tanzania and Uganda and will overtake Kenya. Uh, that's the feedback via the break to the Zentivi Kenya. And Engineer Mushami, uh, of course, uh, briefly, the life does not start or end with an election. We live in this country and it appears uh, as if life has stopped until August 2022. So what in your view would be your word to the Kenyan, whether professional or not, in approaching this election and what they need to do uh, to make it right where we've gotten it wrong over the past few years? Uh, my view, Sam, is that uh, Kenyans must uh, know that they hold the key to changing this nation. Uh, they cannot uh, be keyboard warriors. Uh, writing in Twitter and Facebook, etc., etc., they must go out. They must interrogate the, the candidates. They must listen to what the candidates are saying, not to the rhetoric or the handouts. Ensure that they make decisions that will have an impact on this nation, mm -hmm. on themselves, on their children, and on their children's children. Unfortunately, that's not that's not happening. Every time uh, you go out there and you express an interest in uh, in an electric post. The people out there don't ask you what's your manifesto, what's your agenda, what's your economic model, etc. Et the first thing they ask, uh, does this man have money? <laughs> it's a, when you hear people out there, young people saying, oh, things are okay on the ground, it means the person campaigning is giving out enough hard outs. Mm -hmm. If you hear somebody saying, these are not good on the ground for this candidate, it means he is not giving out uh, enough hard outs. That culture must change. My prayer is that we as professionals can go out there and uh, do civic education to our people that they can make the right decisions. That they don't end up with 50 shillings in their, in their pocket and they will then cry for the next five years. And this business of politicians uh, basically praying to the gallery. Mm -hmm. how, how often do you see a small project and the governor or the local MP or MCA has got his own poster bigger than the project? Because he's taking like personal credit eh, for the project, which has actually been taken by public funds. That is something that we need to be very conscious of. Sam. And sometimes it's a public toilet. Reginald Kazutu, um, engineer Karioki Mushemi, FCPA Rastas Kwaka Omolo, and Dr. Andrew Were. Thank you so much for making time for us to have this conversation. And you do this from time to time to have perspectives from different sectors, from different professionals. and. Kenyans of different walks of life, even those that are not in any of the professions, to understand uh, the heartbeat and the pulse of the nation and what goes on from now on. My name is Sam Gituku. Up next is Sporty Monday. Do stay tuned for that. See you some other time. Bye for now. Don't you try me, don't you try me.